Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 24, Gaming in the New Year. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We're here live over Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers, and each week we hope to highlight some feedback we receive, either positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com, that's S-E-A-N. So today on MeWe, Samantha Bryant posted a review of Vindication in the Tabletop Bellhop MeWe group. This is a game where the premise is that you're a wretched and unworthy debased creature cast ashore on an island. And your goal is to collect honor and possibly redeem yourself along the way. Now, I want to thank Samantha for sharing this on the group. I think it's awesome that it's not just me posting there. And I want to take a moment to welcome everyone to do the same, whether it's the Tabletop Bellhop Me We group, our Facebook page, our G Plus page, which will be there at least till the end of January, maybe, as long as it lasts. Uh, we do welcome everyone to post and contribute. They're not just there for me to tell you about the latest thing we're doing. I'm not just there to share blog updates and podcast updates and Instagram photos. They're there for all of you to post, comment, and interact with us. I welcome everyone to take part in any of our groups. Now, to get to the MeWe group specifically, head to MeWe.com slash join slash tabletop underscore bellhop. It's a little trickier. I do, it's a little trickier yeah, to I get to. I do apologize. We have an underscore there. MeWe would not let me do it as one word, which was a pain in the butt. Now, unfortunately, MeWe uh, is privacy forward as their concept, yeah. um, which is both good and bad. So you actually have to join before you can see anything at all involved uh, with the group or anything else. Now, thanks for sharing with the group, Samantha. Brett Saginar wrote about our discussion on Warhammer Quest, the adventure card game. I couldn't agree more. This was a fantastic co-op card game. The future potential of this game, had, the future potential this game had was enormous. Not just regarding new adventures, but the possibility of introducing new advanced mechanics could have been so much fun. Imagine this game with a corruption mechanic with eventual mutations of characters, or Nurgle being the big baddie in an adventure that included disease. What about adding money as a reward here and there, and the party purchasing that cart to hold more items or gear? The disappointment of FFG losing the license hit this game the hardest, I think. Hmm, maybe some guys from Liber Fanatica can get together to create an unofficial version 2 package? Hmm? Well, thanks for the comment, Brett, and I completely agree. That game had so much potential. Uh, though I haven't actually checked out any of the content, you should be happy to know fans did take the game and kind of run with it. If you go to Board Game Geek page for Warhammer Quest, colon, the adventure card game, there's forums there. If you go to the forums, and then there's a section called Variants. If you head there, you will find a list of fan-made stuff. I found a total of seven quests, um... Three levels, six campaigns, at least eight different heroes, custom legendary gear, enemies, and locations. Now, we'll share the link here in chat, as well as in the show notes, if Henshi Games or Sean can drop that into the chat. Uh, we will throw it in the show notes. It's way too much of a mess to read out online. But I do say check it out. It looks like there's lots of fan-made stuff there. When I finish the next three quests in that game, I do plan on checking these out. It is great. The uh, the extra stuff that shows up on Board Game Greek Geek can be a real benefit. Some of it's not worth it, but uh, it's good to know that the fans are really interested and invested in these games. Yeah, I was really impressed to see full campaigns that have multiple adventures in them. At least one was a six adventure campaign. It looks like people did a lot of work. It's a lot of print and play stuff. At least I haven't tried this stuff. I haven't vetted it yet, but I do think it's worth checking out. And now... Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? So every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. 
So the big thing that happened this past week is we said goodbye to 2018 and hello to 2019. Every year, uh, we celebrate that by gaming in the new year. Uh, this is a big party I have at my house. I invited a bunch of locals uh, over, some friends and family over, and some not-so-locals over. Now, Sean and I played so many games at this event that we're going to save this as the main topic later in the show, where we normally do the Ask the Bell Hop section. For Week in Review, what I am going to talk about is our latest play of Gloomhaven that hit last Friday. Now, with the new year, we're trying to step things up here at the tabletop, uh, at the Bell Hop's tabletop. And while we talk about Gloomhaven all the time, we still are willing to take it up a notch. <laughs> yeah, so the big thing that happened in Gloomhaven is that we brought our game to the world. So last Friday, before Tori and Kat showed up, uh, I went downstairs and set up Anshi Games' laptop. I mounted my webcam on a tripod. I stood the tripod on a gaming table. I moved the shiny new mic. Thanks again for that, Sean. Downstairs, mounted it to a bookcase, and set it like a boom mic. I then got myself into Streamlabs and made a shiny new screen or scene for broadcasting live plays. It sounds so simple. What could go wrong? <laughs> Yeah, of course. I, I, I don't know if it's everything or anything, but it didn't go smoothly at first. I don't know why we've yet to figure it out, but Streamlabs on my PC is somehow not the same Streamlabs as on Anshi Games laptop, despite it being a cloud-based program. I don't know what it is. Something set up different or something. I'm not going to get into details, but it took getting in touch with Sean and another 45 minutes before we could get the stream working. Now, a lot of people have their favorite software and setups, but when you get down to it, the basics across all of them are pretty much the same. Uh, our problem is we have chosen to introduce a distance um, remote <laughs> concept to our thing that, is, that most gamers don't deal with. Uh, most of Twitch is meant for one camera, one game feed, a microphone, all in one room, uh, maybe even a couple of computers, but all in one room that broadcasts out on the internet. Because we're actually bra share sharing data and information across the province, things get a little wackier and we're, we're stretching the limits of what uh, Streamlabs and OBS is possible. Yeah, it seems to be working overall. Uh, I gotta say, once we got the bugs out, and I gotta admit, we still haven't really, like I still don't know why we can't get the camera into widescreen and it's one of those you keep clicking buttons until it is. Uh, yeah, that's what seems to be working. Uh, once it worked, it seemed to work well. Like, the stream seemed strong. I think the angle we had worked. It got all four of us in the picture. I think you could see the board pretty well. Uh, the audio even seemed pretty good for doing an overhead mic, which is why I switched my mic today. I think it worked. Yeah, I was able to be there and moderate, or kibitz, the whole stream, and it went really <laughs> well. If only our podcasts were as consistent and smooth. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's the thing. We'll start broadcasting from downstairs and it'll start working better. So what I want to officially announce now is we are going to try to stream every Gloomhaven game now going forward. So instead of just seeing us on Wednesday nights here doing the live podcast, you will see us Friday nights at about 8.30 p.m. Eastern every week at the usual spot right here at twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop. I'll be there whenever possible to keep things going in the chat room. And we've always had already had some great interest and some smart players there helping and having fun Thanks. alongside with the game. So as for the actual game, uh, we were doing Mission 5. Um, at the at, We were doing Mission 5 that time. Uh, we're still playing with the same four players. We're still playing on easy difficulty, uh, which for what we're doing means level one scenario difficulty. So you take the average party members, divide it by half and all that, and you get number two, and we're playing on easy, so you knock it down to one. So I'm not going to get into specifics here. I would say just check out the blog. TabletopBellhop.com, click on On the Table, looking for the article Gloomhaven, now streaming live, Tabletop Gaming Weekly. The one thing we did find streaming live, without going into all the details of what happened during the mission is, everyone can see your mistakes. And wow, we seem to make a lot of them. It was, I would say, a bit embarrassing. Because you would have figured by our ninth play, we would have gotten the rules down, but it seems that's not the case for us. We've talked about how complex this game is. And it's often the simple interactions that cause the most trouble. Now, I do have to say, in most cases, what we were doing wrong was hurting us. It was not to our advantage to be making these mistakes. Uh, we were not helping ourselves out. There was one term where we forgot to move some bad guys. Maybe in that case, it was on our side. But pretty much every mistake we made was hindering us more than helping us. Uh, for example... 
you could cause when you cause a monster to attack another monster, you get all of the monster's abilities, including things like hitting multiple targets and things like retaliate still happen. We completely miss that. So every time we use uh, the little Skaven dudes, not my character, it's Anchi Games character, ability to possess an enemy to attack people, we were just doing a basic two strength attack and it ends up we should have been using that enemy to all, all of its abilities at once. This was actually a real extreme version, as every correction I saw coming from the audience was helping you, and not once yeah. did you make yourself did make anything easier on yourselves. No, I say, I say except for the one case where we we did forget to move the bad guys, which we probably would have realized by the start of next turn, but I'm not sure. So the big thing I need to do here publicly for everyone to hear is I have to give a shout out to Twitch user Fenton Crackshell. He joined he or she, sorry, I'm assuming he, they joined the stream pretty late into the mission. Uh, they were pointing out our multitude of errors. Now, I know Fenton, I hope you don't mind me just saying Fenton, because Fenton Crackshell gets a little annoying, uh, was worried we'd be pissed off about being corrected so often, and no, no, not at all. If I'm playing a game wrong, please point it out. Same thing, like, if you come play at my house, or we meet in public, or we're at Origins, and we're playing a game together, and you see me make a stake, please point it out. I am not opposed to rule lawyers. I know I'm not perfect. I have far too many games in my head with far too many pages of rule books supposedly memorized, and they get mixed up now and then. And Gloomhaven's about 59 pages of dense, packed, conf not conflicting, but confusing rules. And I don't expect to play it perfectly. So everyone at the table feels the same, too. Like, we okayed this with Cor Tori Cat and Angie Games. We're all like, no, no, please, let us know. And I don't think that's because most of what we did was actually hurting us. He, he wasn't rude. He wasn't ar arrogant. It was simple and plainly just letting us know when yeah. something had been missed or when something had been done wrong. If a group of players can't take that kind of help, well, there might be an ego getting in the way. So feel free uh, to uh, politely correct and uh, and inform. It's It helps everyone. Yeah, I like don't show up and be like, hey, you idiots, you're playing the game wrong. I'm not going to take that well. I will admit that. But if you politely just, hey, you realize you use that obstacle as, or that hindering terrain as an obstacle. And I'm like, whoa, wait, they're different on the map. I thought they're both purple. And he's like, no, one's purple, one's blue. And I like, it's not that I didn't believe him, but I did look up a couple of things. I'm like, yeah, sure enough, I messed that up. Uh, so I, again, uh, shout out to Fenton Crackshell for the crash course on Gloomhaven. It was live to the world. Y'all got to see us mess up. You got to see us play the extreme version and i expect we'll do better next turn and again i invite all of you to join our ongoing campaigns it's now going to be every friday 8 30 ish start time uh tori and cat show up at eight i figure give us half an hour to make sure the stream's working and if you do see us doing something wrong please feel free to point it out especially if it helps keep our spell live spell weaver alive next time we record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Thanks to everyone who subscribes and listens to the podcast. And for others, please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform. Leave a like, thumbs up, or a review so that it's easier for others to find us as well. Yeah, I'll say it again because we haven't said it in a little while, but Apple podcast reviews are big. And the other one that just dropped huge is Spotify, just released their API to the world. So now places are pulling Spotify rankings and Spotify reviews. So iTunes and Spotify reviews are definitely welcome. They'll review us everywhere. I'm cool with that. Even if it's negative, we want to know. Just let us say, if you're going to leave a negative review, don't just throw it on iTunes. Give us a heads up. That'd be cool too. So we can try to fix whatever you found wrong, even if you're no longer listening. We just said it in the last segment, but I think it's worth repeating. We're going to be streaming our Gloomhaven campaign live, live to the world. Join us on Twitch every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. That's twitch.tv forward slash Tabletop Bellhop. So sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I will be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, re-reviews, or anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Every so often, as part of Throwback Thursday, I'm going to resurrect an old piece of gaming content, something I wrote years ago on another platform. I'll be republishing the original article or the original blog post and then adding my thoughts about the topic now. Has my opinion changed over the years? This week, I am going back to my RPG, my role-playing game roots with Marvel superheroes from TSR, the classic yellow box starter set. 
Now this brings on so many feels. A lot of us gamers, at least in our generation and older, were comic book collectors first or at least alongside. We knew and we understood the comics and we wanted to be comic book heroes uh, as we read along with them. So the idea of role playing as them, well, pretty straightforward. Yes, please. Yeah. So unlike most people, uh, most gamers nowadays, even back in the day, started role playing with Dungeons and Dragons. That is the almost a commonality among all gamers. It's not universally true, though. My first role playing experience was TSR's Marvel Superheroes. Now, I discovered this box back in it was 1984-85, and my memory is not perfect enough to to know exactly when, but it's in that time period. Now, my dad was a gamer. He collected RPGs and war games and was big into Avalon Hill bookshelf games. And that was my dad's stuff. I wasn't allowed to touch it, right? Those were the adult games. I had my own board games. I had my Sorry and Top Secret and Go For It and I Want to Bite Your Finger. All such amazing games. Uh, Anyway, my parents were away on a bowling trip. And it was just me and my cousin, John, who was babysitting me at the time. And at that time, we took the chance to sneak down my copy of my dad's TSR Marvel superheroes. Right? And they were dad's games. We weren't supposed to touch them. And we expected something, I don't know. I don't know how to word it. Like complex, heavy, and somehow adult. And to be fair, history proved to us that adult was not an unlikely outcome of such a foray. (laughs) We'll leave that inside joke uh, for Eugene to enjoy and a couple other people. (laughs) So I I had the same thought actually with with Stephen King novels, right? Like my mom used to always leave her horror novels in in the bathroom bookshelf. And I was always like, oh, they're adult. I don't want to touch that, right? And I remember at some point opening them up going, huh, this isn't that adult or that strange or un, un, un alien. I don't know what the proper term is. So same deal with Marvel, right? I opened it up. Here's this box. Here's this uh, black and white booklet that says battle book on it. And it says something like start here. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but something indicated that was the first book you should read. It's like 10 pages long, maybe a little bit more. And it has all the rules. You need to do a superhero beat up like no role playing, just how here's stats. Here's how the stats work. Here's how the universal table works. Here's how to beat each other up. Here's how to hit each other. Here's how to do damage. There was a bunch of character sheets for the thing, Captain Marvel, Captain America and Spider-Man and a bunch of stats for the bad guys. And oh my God, it blew my mind. Like it was just like, it was approachable. It was understandable to a kid of eight nine years old like this all just made sense this was easy like this this was a thing that i could play or we could play you know this is the essence of rpg for youth uh it's simple and it lets the imagination run with just enough of a framework to avoid too many arguments between the kids yeah true enough so my cousin and I sat down and of course we fought some battles, right? We had the thing fight Spider-Man and we had Captain Marvel fight Captain America and so on. And we fought Doc Ock because we had Doc Ock stats and, and it was fun. Like we had, we had quite a bit of fun just doing that. And this was like, I think it was a three day weekend. So sometime after that, we sat down and read the campaign book. Now this is a big orange book that says campaign book and it's thick. Like, well, not really, not compared to like a D&D rule book or some like Numenera or anything like that. But like compared to this battle book, it was like three times as thick, right? I, I couldn't tell you. It's like 100 pages maybe. And this was full RPG rules. It starts off with uh, how to make characters, ongoing adventures, how to run a campaign. And one of the things that is one of Marvel's trademarks, which is their unique XP system called Karma, which was both an in-game resource you could spend to do heroic things. So if you... F- we're going to fail a die roll. You could spend karma to do amazing things. Plus it was also your XP system for leveling up. Not that there were levels in Marvel, but for improving your character, it was brilliant. Like this, this was a system that actually enforced the genre, which was, was something that kind of blew our minds. And of course it hooked us. Like it hooked both me and my cousin. And I, I don't, I'll admit he's not in my local gaming group anymore, but I know he still games. I still play and love RPGs. And I think if it wasn't for that Marvel, I would have never gotten into games as heavy as I did. Well, the RPG community has shifted strongly in the many intervening years. I still think there is a place for games like this. Games where kids just play out what they imagine when they're reading their comics. It's just a shame you need to take out a mortgage to keep up with comics these days. So you can check out my original review of Marvel Superheroes. So the original review was written in 2012. Uh, at that case, I had a group of friends down 
over and we played through Day of the Octopus and we played through the original box. And I think we also played through Breeder Brahms, which, man, that module was terrible. But we still had a lot of fun with it. So in 2012, I re-reviewed the game. I go into detail about everything that's in the box, my love for it, and how I feel now. And obviously, I... As you can tell, I still really dig this system. It was my first, and besides that, it's still a pretty solid system. Yes, it's a little dated. It did come out in the 80s, and even more dated is the Marvel Universe from that time because 80s Marvel is very different from, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, modern Marvel. MCU. Just the comics. Yeah, the MCU or just the, the comic book universe. The, the comics were a little different back in the 80s. Uh, but it strongly encouraged role-playing. And what still blows my mind is it had mechanics that enforced the genre, which is something RPGs still struggle with to this day. The whole karma system, I think, was before its time. I'm always going to have a special place in my heart for Marvel superheroes from TSR. Most episodes, we look to answer one, of your, one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send us your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works, too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, except, obviously, me, we, that made me put an underscore in between there. But everywhere but me, we, Tabletop Bellhop, one word, including YouTube, as of last week. While I prefer if questions come through the website, it's easier for me to track, I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else. Today on Ask the Bellhop, we're taking a break from your questions to recap our Gaming in the New Year party that happened last week. So every year I host a Gaming in the New Year party. I invite a bunch of friends and family over to my house, and we welcome in the new year the best way I know, by gaming. We are perhaps a bit too literal in the name of this podcast, but it's about the tabletop, <laughs> literal and figurative, that has really helped guide our friendship along for many, many years now. <laughs> That's true. So I uh, started off the night, well, actually we had a pretty good day, we did some stuff during the day, had some good food, but uh, once the party started, we had exactly six people there. Uh, this is when we went live with the stream, and that included both my kids and my friend Mike's son. So we wanted something we could all play, something that's family friendly and something that can play uh, multiple ages. So I got Big G to come upstairs and grab her copy of King of Tokyo with the Power Up expansion. Now, unfortunately, while we were teaching the game, uh, another player showed up. So King of Tokyo does play six, according to the box, but then the power-up expansion comes with a panda. So we had seven players, and we figured, ah, why not? We tried it with seven. Sadly, I was busy setting up the stream and chatting with people in, in <laughs> Twitch, so I completely missed out on the explanation of the rules, and my <laughs> gameplay showed as I was quickly the first one eliminated from the game. Yeah, it's, it's not a hard game, but not knowing what's going on does make it a bit difficult. Now, I gotta say, playing with Seven made Tokyo a little too risky. It was a little too rough. It wasn't terrible, though. Uh, I, it's not like it was a tournament, and letting one more person play, I uh, let everyone be involved. So I, I, like, I don't recommend normally playing it with Seven, but you know what? It worked well enough. Uh, overall, I still dig the game. King of Tokyo is one of my kids' favorites. It's a light enough game that the kids get it. Even my youngest, Little G, gets the game fully. Uh, but there's enough going on that adults dig it too, and I thought it was a perfect start for the night. Now, for anyone who doesn't know the game, it's a Yahtzee-based dice game, and what I mean by Yahtzee-based is you're rolling the dice, trying to get sets, and you get to re-roll twice. Uh, the set you're trying to do is um, you're going to get numbers, which give you points. You're going to get like claws, which do damage to other monsters. You're going to get hearts that let you heal. When you actually attack someone, you have to move into Tokyo. Once you're in Tokyo, if someone attacks, they attack Tokyo. The person in Tokyo, when they attack, attacks everyone not in Tokyo. What you're trying to do is play King of the Hill. If you can sit there the whole round in Tokyo, you get some bonus points. It's a quick teach. It's fairly easy to learn, at least when you're paying attention. Now, while I had missed the, actually missed the entire explanation of that the first time, uh, I sat next to the kids, and I ended up going last because of the turn rotation. Youngest went first, yeah. and I was on the other side of them. So by the time the game got around to me, I knew what was going on because it really is that easy to pick up. It didn't yeah. make it any better that I, uh, how I was playing. <laughs> um, the seven players was brutal. Um, it, was, yeah. it was pretty nasty. Yeah, I don't. I don't actually recommend playing seven players. Like, uh, what we should we should have split off. But I just taught the game. It, it probably wasn't the best choice. But you know what? It was the first night game of the night, and the kids loved it. So overall, I do recommend though that any gamer pick up the Power Up expansion. 
I don't think King of Tokyo is complete without it. Like King of Tokyo is okay. It's it's some fun. Maybe I give it a six on Board Game Geek. But you toss power up in, and now every single monster is unique. It becomes an asymmetric game, so all six of your players, or seven, each have a unique character, and it matters what character they are. Now, normally when you roll hearts, you can heal. Well, the hearts let you instead level up your character or get new power-up cards, which I like because normally when you're in Tokyo, those hearts are wasted rolls. With those power-up cards, it gives you a reason to roll hearts in Tokyo, which I think is a good addition to the game. So you don't have a wasted turn. Now, what I really dig is there's a variant, which we didn't use, which is you start the game, everyone draws one card from their power-up deck, so you start each Symmetra from the start. I do strongly recommend, if you're going to play King of Tokyo, pick up power-up. To me, that makes it from an okay game to a good game, like from a 6 to a 7 to 7.5 on Board Game Geek. Yeah, these are great little cards, and they really do level up the game. Um, it's that yeah. difference between, you know, the the kind of throwaway sorry to a game mm -hmm. that you actually have to think about and plan, and, and there's, there's strategy involved. You're not just rolling the dice and, and trying to stand in the best spot. I agree completely. So while we were playing this, a bunch of other people showed up. Um, they, again, everyone was really pushing the, let's play everything, let's play something together. So the first thing that came to mind was a big group game called Codenames. And the reason I wanted to grab this is my past experience with Codenames has been shaky at best. I have had a very, very bad experience trying to teach Codenames to non-gamers. The thing is here... I had a room full of gamers who I actually know fairly well. I will admit there was a couple people there that I, I don't know as well, but most of the people at the party are people I've known for 20, 30 years. So I figure here's a chance to try code names with a group of gamers who I know well. Now, everyone talks about code names. We even talk about code names on yeah. the pod, but I didn't know a thing about it other than it was more <laughs> of a party game than I normally choose. Yeah. Those just aren't my general type of game. Yeah, I agree. And again, I'm not a big party gamer either. It's rare that I find one I like. So what we did is we split the it, code names. Just play you play in two teams, and we split the group into two teams. I couldn't even tell you how many people were on each team, but we had everyone play except for my kids because my kids really wanted to go play Minecraft. So hey, I'll let them go play Minecraft. Um, this is a family weight word game that you put out a grid of words. And you split into two teams. One player is elected to give be the clue giver. And your team's trying to decipher the codes that the clue giver's given. Now, the codes are one word and a number. And then the team uses that cl those clues with word association and familiarity of the person giving the clues to try to guess which words in the grid match it. If you get the word right, you find one of your agents in your team. So if you're the blue team, you get the word right, you flip it over and go, hey, it's a blue agent. We don't flip it over. You put a card on top. Uh, if you mess up and pick one of the other team's words, then they get a point, basically, because the goal is to have all your agents played. Now, the thing you have to watch out for is one of the words has an assassin under it, and if anyone picks it, they lose. Yeah, there were actually only about two people there who yeah. had played and and played often and well enough to to understand and explain the game. But mm -hmm. it's not a tough game. It is just a party game. Uh, the game is listed at four to eight players, but really with teams, any even yeah. number can work. Um, I, honestly, though, I was thinking about it. I would not want to play this game with four players. No. Um, it just seems odd. And uh, the group dynamic that we had, to me, was really what made it fun. Um, especially when the different interpretations from the different people of a clue, uh, allowed for that sort of, you, you know, there's someone's ass is telling you that there's two, two words with one clue and between the group, you've got four possibilities and you just don't know uh -huh. where to go. Uh, it really makes for a enjoyable game. Everyone trying to defend their own, uh, point of view. <laughs> yes. I should, I, to me, that, that was, that's the highlight of code names, right? So like, I now see the appeal of this game. I, I had fun playing it. Uh, that was probably the best code names experience I've had. Um, but yeah, trying to, wait, wait, why did you pick those clues? Like why was, I don't even remember. There was like war or aggression and centaurs because the only time Bill had ever seen centaurs presented on TV, they were warlike. And I'm like, whoa, okay, that was a stretch. Or <laughs> while me messing up and saying Spider-Man, not realizing Octopus was on the board and I didn't want Octopus, you know, and yeah, Doc Ock, Spider-Man kind of go together. Probably should have realized that one. Um, 
it was cool. I, I had fun. I Now I can say Codenames is good with the right group. It is, I still swear, very group dependent. I know a lot of people are like, no, it's the ultimate party game. You can break it out with anyone. No, come to my Christmas Eve party with my mom's family and try playing Codenames. You'll see that it doesn't work with everyone. Now, I got to say, I think New Year's this year, the New Year's game, the New Year's party saved uh, Codenames from the extra life pile for me. I think I'm going to hang on to it for another year because of that. I don't know how many plays I'll get out of it, but I no longer feel like I could better use that space on my shelf. Yeah, I, I don't think it's one I would ever go out and intentionally purchase, but with the right group, I would definitely sit down and play with this one again. Now, I'm going to see if I can change your mind right here on the show, Sean, because know what's coming out this month is Codenames Harry Potter edition. You know, I knew that actually. We, I think we talked about it on on New Year's, <laughs> but uh, again, I don't think it's a four player game. No, uh, and yeah, generally, we don't have enough. Uh, we we don't have a group around big enough to uh, to play. So, yeah, I can't see it being good four player because it's just you and someone else, right? It's you yeah. trying to connect. I don't know. I mean, I'd rather play. It's, like, it's a combined. different game. I I don't think it's a, it's it's a bad game, but it's a very different game. It's more like uh, the old. Um, the old game show where you're trying to get your your opponent to guess and you're trying to connect. thousand dollar pyramid, yeah, or whatever. And, you, and you're trying to to connect with them and 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 sort of get that mind meld going, as opposed yeah. to trying to find so, find a clue that will work for everybody, which is a whole different yeah. sort of mindset. Well, the worst one too is you give a clue and like someone in your group gets it, like they they're totally on the same page, but then someone talks them out of it. Yeah, you're like no. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, code names better better than I remembered. Uh, significantly better than I remembered. So by the time we finished code names, the group had grown. Uh, we had, pretty much everyone was there. It was time to to do the D and D thing you shouldn't do, but the thing you should do at board game events, which is split the party. Uh, I headed over to the video game area. Like my my game room is divided into the the big board game area, and then I have like our, our entertainment center, our, our front room, like most people would have, with the couch and the TV, and that's where the video games are. Well, I threw a three by six table up by the sectional, and um, we got that set up. While well, there was a group setting up Terraforming Mars, and she games was teaching that game. And if I remember correctly, that's when you broke out Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Absolutely. Uh, but this wasn't my copy of Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle. Nope. This was your daughter's copy. Uh, yeah. But since I'd had uh, good luck teaching it with my family, we decided to break it out and I would teach it uh, to her and uh, the group. So we had a group of four ready to go uh, and we jumped in uh, and we shot through all three of the first three books wow. uh, sitting down. And, and I think, again, it, it solidified for me. We had, uh, you know, they were gamers and, and your daughter. And again, people were cheering and excited about seeing cards turn up. And, and you know, everyone's, because of the, the cooperative nature and the nature of the uh, property itself, the Harry Potter property, it mm -hmm. really is an enjoy. If, if you like Harry Potter, it catches you. It really it hooks you in. Oh, that's cool. It sounded like you guys were loud, so it sounded like you were having a lot of fun over there. It was good to hear, like, I think you had both the Barker brothers in the yep. game, didn't you? Yep. Yeah, it was, so I got it. Tom is definitely more of a heavier gamer, right? Like, he's he's one of those players I like to challenge to a, a heavy strategy game. It's cool to see that he enjoyed it yep. as much as Big G did. I well, like that it seems to have that wide a uh, appeal yeah no absolutely if you're if you're a fan of harry potter i think it's just a strong game um although i have to say it's it's hard because <laughs> i'm uh i'm we're, my family's still stuck stuck on book five so <laughs> have you tried again and you're stuck on book we five? have yes we're still oh, stuck wow. on book five so i gotta remember we're gonna have to put you into the the rotation for the tabletop gaming weekly or yeah. is that next week's that'll be next week's technically all right Cool. So we'll hear about Sean's failures next week. <laughs> that sounded way harsher than I meant it to. Sorry. <laughs> that came off badly. Uh, so while Hogwarts and Terraforming Mars was going on, uh, we finished three games. So I guess Hogwarts also finished three games. It's just they played the same game. Uh, we were over on the side table. So the first was Sagrada. Now, I got Sagrada from Christmas. I really dig it. I talked about it quite a bit last week, so I'm not going to repeat how to play the game here because I basically did all that. What I do want to mention is how it was different with three players. I, you know, this was something we touched on a bit last week uh, with rule variations that are both discussed about in Board Game Geek, but also apparently uh, available in uh, some rule books and upcoming reprints. 
Oh, so they're actually changing it new printing. So the thing is, when you play Sagrada with four players, you use all the dice, which is a lot. It's 90 dice. You are using all 90 dice every game. And what it means is every game, not only are you putting all 90 in the bag, you're going to draft all 90 of them. They're all going to come out and play. You're going to empty the bag by the end of the game. And that means there's a perfectly even distribution of the five colors in the game. When you play with less than four players, you don't take any dice out of the bag. So you're still putting all 90 in there. So what that means is there's a really good chance, and I didn't do the math because it's a divisible by five. It might be an always chance that every time there's going to be some numbers that are rare and some that are, are more common because of that. And I think with five dice times 40, again, I'm not doing the math, but I think no matter what, you're going to have at least one color that you're going to have more of and one color you're going to have less of. And it's going to possibly be a significant difference right? Because you're removing a full card worth. You're removing 20 dice, I think it is, just by removing a player. So what this means is it's going to affect scoring because every single player gets a personal scoring card at the beginning of the game that it, all it is is one die, and it's one of the five colors. So if you happen to get the red die and less reds come up during the game, you're kind of, you're going to be affected, right? Like you're going to have a harder time scoring your red than say, NG Games, who's collecting green dice, and there's more green dice, in the, well, not in the bag, but more green dice that come out. Yeah, so the rumor has it, uh, in the rule set for the uh, player expansion that brings it to, I guess, five and six, or, or, or six and seven players, whatever it is. I think it goes um, up to five, but I'm yeah, not Yeah, so the, 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 the next expansion that allows more players, uh, there is a rule that allows you to take dice out for lower player counts. Uh, okay. And then that will be accommodated into the second printing of the uh, main rule book. The base game. That yeah. makes sense. Like, Because I got to say, it, it wasn't a bad thing or really a good thing. It's just a thing. But I think it's something people need to be aware of. Because I know there's hardcore gamers out there that want everything to be perfect information and perfect balance, right? There, I, I play with gamers like that. I'm not one of them. I don't really care that much. That's why I said it's not really good or a bad thing. But like, there's no way on the last turn now or the second to last turn to go, okay, you have four red, you have four red. Okay, so there's three left in the bag. So no matter what, three reds are coming out. Like, you can't do that when you're playing with three people. Like, you, well, you could, but then you're working on probabilities as opposed to sure things. So I, I just want people to be aware when they buy Sagrada that if you're not planning on playing with the full player count, don't expect that perfect information. Unless, I guess, you find these variant rules on Board Game Geek. Yeah, I've never been uh, the type to card count, or in this case, dice count, but I know that there are people who fall on both sides oh, yeah. of it, both who want to and uh, think it is a sin against God and dice. <laughs> uh. Yeah, no, I, I definitely, well, I grew up with my dad. My dad was very much a card counter who would get very frustrated if you did not play optimally because you weren't counting cards as well, right? You'd be playing hearts with him and you'd lead something and he's like, but you know, he has three of these. And I'm like, no, I don't. And he's like, well, you <laughs> should because, right? Like I grew up with that. So I know yeah. there's players like that. I know local players like that. They exist, right? People take their, some people take their games very seriously. There's nothing wrong with that. Just something to be aware of. So after Sagrada, I broke out my, uh, broke's a good word, broke out my newly repaired copy of Gizmos. Yes, I said repaired, because before the party started, Sean and Angie Games and I took the opportunity to record a bunch of unboxing videos, stuff we plan on releasing on YouTube eventually. I actually got through the editing of Gizmos this weekend, only to discover that the Twitch stream we've been using had been a little glitchy. We, you know, the streams are what they are and uh, subject to internet hazards. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we didn't have another copy of that particular camera source. So it has been put off for the moment, but uh, hopefully you'll see something. So one of those, uh, not lost videos, but videos <laughs> you may never get to see uh, was me unboxing Gizmos. Um, the unboxing went, Good enough, right? I showed off everything in the box. And then I decided live, I kind of did a, hey, we're done the unboxing. You've seen it. You see everything that's in here. But what I'm going to do, if you want to stick around, is build the energy dispenser, which is this cardboard hopper thing that's a part of the game that, that slowly puts out. They're not marbles, but they look like marbles, little round plastic balls in different colors. And while trying to put that together, it was going together pretty good until I got to putting the top on. And while I was putting the top on, the cardboard underneath basically popped. It wasn't like a ripping sound. It was just like a pop. And both tabs on both sides just flew off. And no, I wasn't using excessive force. I was 
just trying to put this on, I would think, as anyone else was. No hammers involved or anything. And I got to admit, I was, uh, as you would expect, a little frustrated and disappointed with Gizmos at this point. All right. And so there we've seen the uh, the disaster itself. <laughs> After this short disaster, uh, I took a look at the box, like the, the game box, not the thing I just built, uh, to see how this thing was going to store. And it ends up that the bottom piece the, of the energy dispenser actually goes into the box complete, like totally solid. And then the top uh, topper walls part uh, folds up and goes on top. So that meant I could do whatever I wanted to the bottom to reinforce it or make it stronger. And that's what I did uh, as I went and grabbed some glue and some tape and I put my, um, you know, box insert assembly experience to use reinforcing gizmos. I taped up all the corners and I glued all the joints. So while frustrating and annoying, it doesn't actually make yeah. the game unplayable if you're willing to take the time to do a little repair work. Yeah, I got to admit, I, I'm disappointed. Like it, it's cool mini or not. I expect better from them. I don't know if the humidity in my basement or what, like the cardboard just did not hold up well. I've got D and D dungeon tiles that build 3d things that have been great for 10 years. This gizmos didn't even make it a day, but repairing it did work like tape glue. As long as you only tape or glue the bottom, it'll work. It worked great. Actually. Like by the time we were ready to play that night, all the glue had dried, everything was good. And my energy dispenser was working great. Well, as great as any cardboard hopper system works, you still got to jiggle it now and then. But that has nothing to do with mind breaking. That's just a, a prop not quite working perfectly. I'm actually sad I didn't get over there to try this one out. From the looks of it, it's a blast yeah. to play. Everyone seemed to be enjoying it whenever I glanced over or brought the camera over to uh, take a peek. Yeah, it's solid. It's it's very solid, um, abstract engine building game. Uh, you're building gizmos for a science fair. That's your your theme. And you do this by spending energy from this energy dispenser, right? Which is the cardboard gumball machine looking thing. And the point of that is so that only, I think it's six energy balls come out at a time. So when you're using the pick action to turn, take energy, you only have a choice of six. You get to see six and you can't see what's coming next, right? So that's the mechanic, the neat thing this piece of cardboard does. So each turn, you're going to pick an action. Depending on that action you pick, some of your gizmos will go off. So these actions include things like picking energy, which is taking one off the hopper, doing research, which is looking through the decks of gizmos to try to find one you want to build, actually building gizmos, or filing a gizmo, which is you take the plans for it and put it off to the side of your board to build later. Uh, there's a couple other things, like there's rules for converting. And then you have levels for things, how much energy you can hold, how many gizmos you can file, and when you research, how many cards you look at. Now, each gizmo you build, which are all represented by cards, goes under these actions. So, for example, you could build a gizmo that goes under your pick action. And then every time you do a pick action, there's a chance that gizmo will fire off or go get used. So you could pay, build another one that says uh, every time you file something, this goes off. So you could have it set up so that, you know, every time you pick a red energy from the energy collector, your gizmos under pick say, well, when you pick a red energy, you get a free pick and then you get to pick a second time. Or you have a gizmo under filing that every time you file a gizmo, you get a free pick and so on. It's a lot of uh, a lot of complex interactions. This is not one of those games we talk about where uh, the simplicity of it all is uh, is what brings it together. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of part moving parts. It literally uh, in this, uh, in a way, yeah, it's a lot of stuff, though surprisingly simple for what it is, right? So, what you're trying to do really is get your gizmo so they chain off each other. So, yes, you could just buy whatever's available or buy the cheapest cards or buy the ones that are worth the most point. But really, the, the strategy of the game is to try to set up like a Rube Goldberg style chain of gizmos so you get the most of your actions. So just as an example, we're playing a game, it's fairly late into the game, and I have a turn where I build a level three gizmo. And because, or I file a level three gizmo, and because I filed a gizmo, I get two free picks. So I pick a yellow out of the thing. And then because I pick the yellow, I look at my gizmo, so that gives me a free pick. Well, I do my random pick, and then I go back to the other free pick that I got from my first gizmo, and I pick a red. Well, because I picked the red, I've got another gizmo that lets me build a blue machine. So since I built a blue machine, I get a victory point and another three pick, and so on. And that's, instead of having you do one action, you're doing one action to set off a whole chain of your gizmos, if you're doing it properly. 
So it's sort of like a combination deck builder, idle clicker with marbles. <laughs> yeah, I guess. More of a tableau builder because you don't have right. a deck. So you're just putting the cards in front of you and it, it's it's well done because you just get a, a strip of cardboard that has all the actions and you just slot the gizmos under which action. So it's actually, like I said, it's, it's surprising. It sounds way more complicated talking about it than it actually is. I wish you had gotten a chance to play it just to see how simple it is because really there's only the six actions. Each action is really simple. And it's one of those where you start simple and build on it. So at the very beginning of the game, you don't have any gizmos. So it's really simple. When I pick, I pick and I take a marble and I put it in my thing. When I build, I take one thing and I put it down. And it's not until later of the game, you're going to get that whole interplay of when I do this, then this happens. So this happens, then that happens. Right. A lot of the beginning of the game is I pick a marble. I spend that marble to build this thing. I pick another marble. I wait till it goes around. Okay, I pick a marble. Because I picked a marble, I get another one. Like, it starts off very simple, then builds quickly. I got to say, overall, it's really cool. I, I liked it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so much fun that we played three times in a row. I strongly recommend this one if you dig abstract engine building games. Now, by abstract engine building games, I'm talking about games like Splendor or Century Spice Road. And I personally think, so far, based on uh, five plays, Gizmo's beats both of those. I am going to choose Gizmos over Splendor or Sentry anytime. Although technically, I don't think you can call Gizmos a abstract engine building game. You are building engines. That's the whole point. Well, that's true. <laughs> Ab abstract <laughs> grabbing marbles that represent energy to power your things. I don't know. It's less, less abstract than chess, but definitely more abstract than, um, I don't know, Memoir 44. <laughs> Well, if you're uh, if you're putting this over Century Spice and Splendor, I think that's a pretty solid recommendation. Yeah, that'll probably surprise some people, but I've, I've never actually been that big a Splendor fan. So at this point, we probably would have played another round of Gizmos, but at this time, midnight had hit. Um, some people were heading home. Kids had headed up to bed. So it was time to regroup. So at this point, we had exactly 10 people left, 10 gamers left. So we split into two groups of five. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a big sort of shuffle around of all the players. Some left, some, some, uh, <clears throat> some picked their game, and we uh, all found a, a place to sit down. It was... Uh... It's when you when you get that those two five player groups, it's hard to find that ideal balance because you're gonna yeah. you're always gonna want it's gonna be six and four or or three mm -hmm. and seven and you got to find those two right games. But luckily, uh, everyone there is pretty much a, as big a fan of terraforming Mars as you. And uh, yeah, so that, and, and that was the big thing that got set up. Yeah, yeah. And she game set up a, another game of terraforming Mars, uh, leaving five of us to decide what to do with ourselves while they set that up. Um, what I ended up doing though is taking advantage of the fact Sean was there and I grabbed Takedo with the Crossroads expansion. Now we've talked about Takedo on the show quite a bit and Sean's even talked about it. We talk about how we play it a lot on Board Game Arena and I thought it would be cool to let Sean play the physical copy because he'd never seen the actual physical board game. He'd only ever played it online. So at this point I'm going to let Sean take over as I've talked about Takedo a ton on the show and he hasn't had that much to say about it. So... So this is actually my first time hands-on with Takedo, actually touching pieces and cards yeah. uh, after playing it so many times on Board <laughs> Game Arena. Uh, it was an interesting experience, I have to say. It's really easy to forget just how much work Board Game Arena does for you uh, mm -hmm. and how much management there is. Um, it's, it's really easy to forget about all that when you've got a computing cluster doing all the math and, uh, and juggling for you. Yeah, especially especially keeping score. That that's the biggest one. Because in that game, I swear it's like every little thing you do gets you at least one point. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, I spent a dollar doing this. Oh, you get one point. Oh, you get three points. Oh, you get two points. Oh, you eight. Don't forget that six points. Yeah. And it is so easy to forget keeping track of your score. Plus, the other thing I found that where it's almost better on Board Game Arena is the same reason we said Seven Wonders is better, is it's almost impossible to keep track with five players of what everyone else is collecting. Whereas on the app, it's very easy just to scroll down and be like, oh, okay, you're already collecting C uh, panoramas. Maybe I want to avoid those. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, just just today I was playing hand and uh, I decided to bail on my, on my mountain panoramas because somebody was already <laughs> uh, one or two ahead. Uh, that so that all being said, it is still a great game, and yeah. the Crossroads expansion really makes it a different, even better game. Mm. Um, honestly, I, I can't encourage players enough to go out and and try and and probably buy that Crossroads expansion. Um, 
even even more so than when we were talking about King of Tokyo, this really levels up the game and makes uh, gives just gives you so many more options to choose from that it becomes a, just a stronger game, in my opinion. Yeah, with the group we were playing with, if I remember correctly, someone had never played before at all, and they really liked the theme. Um, but then two of the other players had never tried Crossroads, and I think both of them really enjoyed having Crossroads in there. Scott, in particular, seemed particularly taken with the the be able to have options when he stopped at different places. Yeah, it just makes such a difference. And and some of the characters are actually from Crossroads too, right? The car, the characters yes. are yeah. yeah the, the, you get the better the better choice of characters once you uh, jump into Crossroads. Um, yeah, it's six although, or so new characters. Although I have to say, not many people tend to role play during uh, the playing of Shikaido, <laughs> um, like our like our thief happened to. <laughs> yeah, well, the gambler. The gambler. The gambler sorry. Yes, yeah. the gambler. Hey, I'll admit I didn't win the game, but I was playing a gambler, so I, I gambled every chance I could. Yep, I know. That's, I know that's what, what happened. And that was fun, actually. Talking talking about keeping scoring, uh, we had thought I had won. Um, yes. and I was, I was pretty sure I had won and then everyone double checked their scores and I got beat out by one point. One point. Um, that yeah, was Scott. It was, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was, yeah. it was, and it was, it was just fun. You know, I, I really enjoy, and, and the score really ranks up a lot higher with that crossroads. That's the other thing. Yes. Um, you're not going to finish the game with 30 or 40 points. You're going to finish the game with 60 or 80 points. Mm -hmm. So. And then it did teach me a life lesson. That if you gamble all the time, you're eventually going to lose everything. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I had fun though. Uh, so that finished up. Uh, we looked over terraforming Mars. I don't know. I think they're at like 1% terraformed at this point. So five player terraforming Mars with Venus next is not a fast game. So I looked around for another five player game uh, with the group that we had. And we had a fairly new gamer in the group. So I wanted something fairly simple to teach and easy to play that wasn't much of a brain burner. Uh, and I grabbed The Climbers from Capstone Games. One of the coolest games I own in my collection Like, it is a very physical game that involves rectangular and square building blocks. Now, when you first see it, you're going to look at it and go, oh, it's a dexterity game. And a lot of people are going to be turned off thinking it's a dexterity game, but it's not. Yes, you have to move blocks, which requires dexterity, but it's not your skill at moving blocks that's being tested here. Yeah. If you get a couple of drinks into you, your lack of dexterity can cause yes. some real problems for everyone else in the game. But it doesn't actually you don't actually require that dexterity to uh, to win. Yeah, and these are big chunky blocks. Like I you you'd have to overdo it quite a bit, I think, before you'd have bad enough dexterity to topple the whole tower. Uh every now and then getting a piece out of the middle can be a bit dex difficult. So what this game is is you have a big pile of blocks built into like a big square, and every turn you're gonna move a block, and then if you can, your climber's gonna climb up. And then as a side note, so is everyone else's climber. Um, you can your climbers are little wooden dudes, and they can only climb up half a block height at a time. And they can only move on to their own color or white. So every block is six-sided, right? Because it's a block. It's a cube or a rectangle. So it's got the five player colors and white. So every block has your player color on it somewhere. And it has white. And white is neutral. Anyone can move on it. And the goal of the game is to be the highest on the block mountain that's growing when a turn goes by where no one else was able to climb up where no one, not no one else, but no one was able. So if I wasn't able, every, every player was not able to go up at least once. And it goes around the table like that, then it ends. Whereas you could be on the top and as the guy at the very bottom keeps moving up a bit, the keep, game keeps going on. So to help you get to the top, you get two ladders and a blocking disc. Now, ladders can be discarded to climb up blocks you couldn't reach normally. And there's a long and a short one. One way lets you climb up one block, the other one lets you climb tall blocks. And the blocking disc is a, a screw your neighbor type of thing where you can put it on a block and no one can touch that block until it comes back around to your turn. Yeah. The other, the other interesting little thing is you can't move a piece that has just been moved before. Yeah. Now, in a two or three player game, that's really important because you can really uh, mess mm -hmm. up someone else by intentionally moving a piece, even if you can't use it. In a five player game, however, that becomes a lot less useful of a mechanic. Yeah. And that's tough. Um, so I found this game was really different with five players than with two or, or three. Um, there's an opening technique I've tried a couple of times that I'm, I like, I tend, I, I like, <laughs> um, and it's not any kind of amazing trick. But what it's done, it's helped me avoid what happens, especially when you've got some newer play players who haven't played before. Uh, people mm -hmm. tend to bunch up and all go in the same yeah. direction because of the ability to move on anyone else's turn. 
Uh, and I try to go around and, and, and dodge that. Um, but what I wasn't expecting was how very differently things were going to go with five yeah. players. Um, and it was shocking. Yeah. And like talk about grouping, like how many times did we have four players standing on the same block? Like I had not seen that. Yeah. I don't think ever before. Now I usually really dig the climbers. It's, it's unique. Like I don't own anything else like it. And I have a fairly extensive board game library. So any game that does something completely new is awesome to me. Like I want that in my collection. That's one reason I have this game. Plus it's simple. Like it's, I ba we basically covered the rules. If I if I had it physically in front of me and showed you, you'd get the game. It's not hard. But for some reason this time, I just was not feeling it. Now, I don't know if it's because it was 3 a.m. at this point and everyone's getting tired or it was the five-player thing because, man, that was the most cutthroat game of climbers. And I spent more time just going, I can't I'd just move a block because I can't move anywhere than I think I've ever had in a game of Climbers. Like, it wasn't a bad game. I'm not like, oh, I regret playing Climbers with this group. It was okay, but, like, I've played way better games of Climbers. Usually I finish Climbers. I'm like, oh, wasn't that good? You know, you can go buy a copy at the game store. No, this was just, eh, we played Climbers. It was okay. Yeah, I, I fully agree here. And personally, I, I feel it was the five-player nature of the game yeah. uh, rather than anything else. Um, the extended time between turns... Yeah, really makes planning uh, essentially pointless, I guess. Um, and I feel personally, I thought three was the sweet spot. Uh, if you look on the recommendations on Board Game Geek, mm. they say four. But you know, okay. with three or four, uh, it really hits a sweet spot where you can still plan ahead and 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 try to mess with other people, but you're not you know just two playering it, which is going to be a very different game. Yeah, two player. It's very unique. Two play. It's it's kind of like I've said about Takedo, where Takedo two player is a very different game, very cutthroat. Two player climbers oh, is yeah. the same thing. Like it's it's more about screwing your neighbor than it is about going up the mountain. Yeah. Three player, I do dig it. Like last time we played was at um, Queen City Conquest. Yeah, the three of us played. Uh, Sean, myself, and Angie Games. We had a great time, and it played great. And other people were watching us play, and there was cheering. Like I, that's that's my usual experience with climbers I, I might not have played it with five before to be honest it might have been my first time playing with five and i i gotta agree at four or less for sure possibly three is the sweet spot yep so once we finished climbers a few more people headed home uh basically the people we were playing climbers with terraforming mars was literally wrapping up you could tell that they had maybe one or two turns left. I think there was two lakes left and that's it. So they were going to end. And um, then I took this chance. I'm like, all right, it's just Sean and I, they're playing race or uh, they're playing terraforming Mars over there. They're happy. Now's the chance. I am going to finally teach Sean race for the galaxy. He is going to learn this. We have talked about this since before we went to queen city conquest. We tried at queen city conquest, but trying to do it on pizza log night was probably not the best choice. <laughs> didn't work. Oh. <laughs> so for the first game to make things as I don't want to say simple because Grace for the Galaxy is not simple, but I want to make things as clear as possible. I took the time to sort out all the expansions of promo cards. Now I own three expansions for this game. I've got a ton of promos. I don't even know how many promos, but I have promos from Origins. I have promos from the Dice Tower. I've, I've got a lot of extra cards for my copy of Race for the Galaxy. Being one of my favorite games, it's one of the few games that I actually like, try to catch them all, right? I try to get all the bits. I even have a really nice broken token insert for it and everything sorted out. But I figured for teaching the game, one of the mistakes I might have made at Breakout was leaving everything in and telling, oh, ignore that because it's from an expander. Ignore this, ignore that. No, like, let's just get all that stuff out. I just want to teach the base game Nothing special, no drafting, no special rules, no picking a starting planet, just bang, here's your hand, let's go. And I think it went well. What do you think? Well, and I think this really speaks to two things. One, <laughs> learning some games on Board Game Arena is a really yeah. bad idea. Straight yeah. up. Uh, and then the next thing is don't try and learn Race for the Galaxy when you're not focused on learning. Uh, Pizza Log Night was a Bad time to try and learn this. Um, we were we were hanging around a bunch of great people, having a bunch of really great conversations. Uh, even though I don't think either one of us were actually drinking, uh, the environment was no. you know in a, in a in the back room of a pub, and uh, it it just think you know my mind was elsewhere and I wasn't uh, yeah. I wasn't picking it up this time. Uh, I got it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, and I was eager to play more. 
Now we need the LLV music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. That's awesome. Uh, I, I showed off the first game. I th- Sean kicked my butt for one, which is either Sean's superpower, which is often win a game the first time you play it, no matter how good or bad you actually play. Yeah. He's had that power since we were kids. You <laughs> jump on a video game and he'd win the first round. Um, and it's, it's a matter of the, the base game, because one of the things with the base game is I find the base game very random. Uh, you have no choices at the start of the game. You're just given a bunch of cards, you do what you can with them, and you can end up with a bad starting hand. So what I wanted to do is showcase what I like about Race for the Galaxy, which to me requires the Gathering Storm expansion, which is the first expansion. To me, that's a must-have. We've now mentioned, I think, three must-have expansions on this particular episode. Today's where New Year's where we try to sell people... Uh, expansions for games they already own i personally don't think you should play race of the galaxy without it you should teach it without it it seems that that seems to be a case but one of the things it does it removes a lot of the random luck by allowing some initial drafting so you get two starting worlds to pick from uh which can really change how you play because you get to compare it to your hand and you can try to set up a synergy so right at the beginning you're building good military or right at the beginning you already have a way to produce and sell or you at least have multiple alien worlds so you at least get a focus the other thing is we want to use the most and first goals which are something that come with gathering storm which again give much needed direction at the beginning of the game so you're not just looking at these cards going i don't know what to do with these you're going oh wow i get points if i collect three alien cards or i get points if i collect victory point tokens or whatever i don't even remember what came up in our particular game so i mixed all the expansion cards back in and we played one more game and i think this went better than the first I'm really looking forward to playing it on, on Board Game Arena now that I get it uh, so that we yeah. can play more often and uh, because I think I understand it enough now that the, the strangeness of Board Game Arena just yeah. uh, doesn't. Like the, the Board Game Arena version of Race for the Galaxy is good, but you have to know the game. Like th- it does not do a good job of explaining the icons or how to play the game at all. But the cards are very readable. So if you know how to play, Board Game Arena works great, but know how to play first. So by the time we finished our second game of Race for the Galaxy, the night was coming to an end. Uh, Terraforming Mars had ended. Everyone was saying good night. Overall, I got to say that was a really good game in the new year. One of the better we've had. I know I had a great time, fit in lots of games, and I swear it was more games this year than it was last year. I don't know if we played shorter stuff, but it just, I felt accomplished. I'm like, man, I played like eight different games. That, that was a good game in the New Year's. Now, I didn't check my board game geek stats to see if I did play more last year or this year, but it felt good. Yeah, it was it was definitely a successful event. I don't think there were as many people as we've had on some occasions. And so the the, the total number of games yeah. being played by everybody was, I think, a little less. We didn't have we didn't have to go upstairs and set up the uh, the additional tables. Yeah, but uh, it was a great time had by all. And uh, we actually played more large group games than I think we often have, like the, with the code names yeah. and King of Tokyo. So that was an enjoyable. Uh, usually, usually there's one one game with everybody at the beginning of the night and then it breaks up. And the fact that we had more than that was a nice, uh, a nice change for the party. Yeah, that wasn't, usually it ends up, we play, um, what is that? Dead man's draw, the dice game, mm. not dead man's draw. What is it? What is it? Liar's dice. Is usually often how we'll start the night because the Liar's Dice can play any number of people with enough cups. And we'll play a game of that and then we break up right away. The, there were a couple people really pushing for the party games. And you know what? Normally I'd be like, oh, I wanted to play something bigger. No, I was fine with it. Yep. It was good for that group. And actually, I, I know NG Games actually appreciates the fact we didn't have to spill over to another floor. So <laughs> that it was the perfect number of people for that. Absolutely. So though the night was over, we're not quite done yet. So after some much needed sleep and some excellent New Year's Day breakfast at a local greasy spoon, lunch. we had one more game to lunch, brunch, <laughs> whatever. I don't know. I, if, if the first meal I eat when I get up, it's breakfast. Uh, we had, I think I skipped lunch that day. I might eat lunch too. But anyway, we had one more game I wanted to play or Sean wanted to play. We wanted to play before Sean headed home to Hamilton. And that was Key Forge. Now, back in the day, I was a huge Magic the Gathering fan, as well as uh, the card game Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, So really, if anything, I am the target market for Richard Garfield's games uh, like Keyforge. Very true. Very true. Uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle was actually the name of the card game after they renamed it from the name that we're not supposed to talk about. All right. (laughs) But yeah, that's they're still supported, actually, fan supported game. Kind of interesting. 
But anyway, back to Keyforge. We decided to make a production of it. Since all three of us were there, Enchi Game, Sean and I, all of the Tabletop Bellhop team, and we had all the equipment on hand, like Sean had brought down a handy cam or a hand cam. We had the new mic and everything. We decided to record uh, myself teaching Sean how to play Keyforge. And then once we got going, we just left the cameras on and recorded the entire play. So an entire thing. So we're looking it up in our level, and uh, since we're all there, practice makes perfect. So why not use the equipment we've got? Yeah, we did. We used that that weekend. Well, it wasn't really a weekend. It was a Monday and a Tuesday to try to get lots of video recorded, actually, with the unboxings and that. So in general, I think uh, the teach went pretty good uh, for a game I'd only ever played twice and taught once. Uh, I did have to look up a couple things. Um one of the being how many cards you start with in your hand, which I now know is first player gets seven and the second player gets six, but I couldn't remember that off the top of my head. There was something else except for that. I think it went pretty smoothly. Uh, we dropped into actual play quickly. Like I'd started explaining stuff and then I'm like, no, let's just draw cards and go. Um, as is true in many of these card games, because really the rule interactions only come out once you have the cards in hand and once the cards are interacting with each other. The basic rules are really simple, though. It's uh, pick a faction, play and use the cards of that faction, done. Right. That's kind of it. Yeah, and again, for anyone familiar with magic, Pokemon, or the like, it's it's really not tough to pick up. There are some concepts that are different. The 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 mm -hmm. fact that you're not paying for things, yes. you're just choosing a faction. And but once you've chosen that faction, you can touch any card you have of that faction. Yes. Um, and the only time you can touch another faction is if the card tells you to. Um, and that's so that's very different. The 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 lack of a cost is something yes. that takes a second to wrap your head around. But once you've got and no that, resource. Yeah. Um, like no and, resource to spend even. Yeah, you don't have, there's no mana, there's no land, there's no energy, there's no anything. It's, right. it's, it's You just pick that faction and go. Um, mm -hmm. But in some ways, that's a, that's a freeing thing. So it's actually yes. it makes things easier. Um, and so really, it, it's nothing drastic for anyone who is already familiar with a uh, any generic kind of collectible card game. Yeah, so far I'm digging it. Like I'm really digging Keyforge. It's it's much better than I thought it would be. Uh, for this teaching game, I broke up the starter set. Yes, I did get a starter set, and yes, I still think it's worth owning one, uh, even just for all the counters and tokens and the chain track and the I can't remember what the two cards are, but there's two cards you can use to mark things. Um, I I do think the the starter set's worth picking up, despite what some people's opinions are. No, you don't need it, but I really do think the components help. Um, and then, plus, I knew the starter set came with two intro decks that were perfectly balanced against each other, right? These are well-placed, tested decks that Richard Garfield designed and put in the game just for teaching it. So I fear the best way to teach it would be to use these two decks instead of grabbing two of the random ones that we opened over the weekend. And I think it went really well. Um, I know I had a good time. Your thoughts on it? Well, by the time I got home, I was already considering <laughs> buying a starter pack so that we could stream play li live between us, uh, and I'd still have all the tokens. Uh, bad for the <laughs> wallet, but it says a lot about how uh, how much I enjoyed the game playing it. Yeah, so by 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 next month, if you're mid-February, we'll be streaming the podcast on Wednesdays, we'll be streaming Gloomhaven on Fridays, and then Mondays, we'll be streaming Sean and I playing Keyforge. <laughs> Uh, no, that's not a promise. That, that may, <laughs> may or not, may not happen. Uh, no, I could tell even playing you that game, and I'm like, I could see it in your eyes. Like, the, yep. the magic, the, the the joy of, ooh, if I use this card, and if I use, oh, and I, oh, man, I, I got to pick up a deck for this. I, I could see it yep. happening. And I yeah, finally Sean and I I also, played a lot of cards. I also finally broke down and uh, installed Steam on my computer and uh, put in Ascension on. So I've got Ascension on the computer Oh, wow. Now. So There you go. Yeah, we can we can we can stream Ascension now if we want to. There, that's the other thing Sean did is he logged his plays for the first time ever. That should have been that's in the true. notes here somewhere. That's true. We, I... we 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 popped his BGG cherry. He made a board game geek an account, and as of midnight, New Year's Eve, Sean started recording plays in 2019. So yeah, and I I even uh, thanks to um, was it. Uh, Oh shoot! I forgot. I don't have my Twitter open. Uh, one of our one of our followers and listeners uh, showed off his stats for the year uh, using mm -hmm. an app, uh, and I was so intrigued. BG by stats. It. BG stats. Yes, at BG stats yeah. on Twitter, uh, and I was so intrigued by the display of it. I went and 
used my Google my Google free money to buy that app, yes. and uh, I have since used it, and I am now recording my plays on my phone straight into that. And uh, there you go. See, yeah. I don't even have BG stats. I, yeah. I haven't even paid for that one yet. And it actually records even more details than than Board Game Geek, so I can like track who I'm playing with and where, and and all sorts of fun stuff. Nice. Does it actually convert that data to Board Game Geek? Uh, like is... I know it reads from Board Game Geek, but does it send it back? You know what? I haven't honestly looked. So <laughs> okay, yeah. I need to figure that out. Next, I still want to use Board Game Geek for some stuff. That Absolutely. I... Yeah. Next next week I'll have a uh, I'll have a report on at BG, BG there stats. Go. There we go. Sounds good. Well, we'll have to add in a segment. So that was it. That that was gaming in the new year. That's how you welcome in the new year bellhop style, playing a bunch of games with friends and family. Uh, the one thing we hadn't mentioned yet, though, is we did live stream this entire thing. Well, most of the entire thing around 2 a.m. when all of my Windows updates and PlayStation and everything I tell, hey, update while I'm sleeping. Well, I wasn't sleeping and my bandwidth went to, to poop at about 2 a.m. So that's when uh, things got a little choppy and didn't work so great. But overall, uh, I think the stream went really well. It went amazingly well compared to our uh, opening party. Uh, our Absolutely. launch party, <laughs> way better than our launch party. So this is something we're probably going to do every year. So before the glitches, we had about seven and a half hours of content, and that's not including the unboxing streams, which was another yeah. hour and a half or so of content prior to the party. It was great to see everyone swing by, both local and international. Yeah, we got some uh, some new viewers, some new followers, which is fantastic. Uh, we're going to do it next year. I don't see why we wouldn't. So here's your very early invitation. Join us next year where we'll be gaming in the new year once again. All right. And uh, I see a few uh, other people have joined us in the chat room but are staying pretty quiet. Awesome. Uh, apparently, the Hallelujah did play at some point, but I don't know when. Uh, it sounded like it stomped all over you, though, so I don't know. Oh, ouch. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'll, I need to uh, test. Well, it actually is in OBS as a source, um, so that's why I'm not quite sure what happened. I'm I'm triggering the OBS source through my stream deck, so I don't understand why it worked in pre-show. I was hearing it and doing it, and then all of a sudden it stopped working. But anyway... We'll worry about yeah, that another night. We're, we're trying to make the show too fancy. Maybe we're better off just. Hey, we, to just we got the video clip. Place. The video clip worked, so we okay, got, cool. We got one for sure. I haven't even seen that video clip. I'm, uh, I'm going to call it Moe's willpower to not swear clip. <laughs> well, the it's it's basically just the two. I, I did a, I did a back to back uh, two different angles of you breaking the uh, the box. Ah, so awesome. you can you can see the, the you can see the full gizmo copy uh, when your eyes better. It's sitting in our Google Drive. Yeah, I'll take a look at it. I know you showed it uploaded it the other day. Yeah. <laughs> other other things in the mind. All right. Well, that was a great little discussion about what happened on our New Year's Eve gaming in the New Year's. For more gaming content, including reviews, game, game night advice, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. As of right now, patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped up to the top of our question list. As mentioned last episode, by the end of the month, we do hope to have revised all of our patron levels. You're not going to lose anything you currently get. We're just hoping to offer more. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to all of our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. A uh, shout out to the misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, and Bob and Camden every Tuesday night at 840 Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Yeah, when they're not sick. <laughs> yes, uh, Brian, everyone's. Everyone, yep. Brian Kurtz, it was glad, great to hear from you on New Year's. Uh, Duran Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks very much. Steve D, thank you for your support and for joining us almost every time we do anything online. Jeff Zeus, thank you. And William Fisher, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. 
Remember to join us here every Wednesday night at 9.30 Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>